Hi, my name is Christy Garcia, and I'm the trainer for Advantage Treatment Centers. Today, we're going to cover the standards on PREA and ATC's response to the PREA policies. So let's go ahead and get started. Before we dive into the presentation itself, I wanted to make note that there is a corresponding Google form that also covers um, many of the PREA links in this video, um, a video that is shown as well as an article. So you may wanna follow along with the Google form to be able to answer the questions required in the form as well as have those links and articles available to you. Now on with the presentation. First, sensitive material warning. The material covered in this lesson plan is of a very sensitive matter. The performance objectives for our PREA training is to gain a better understanding of PREA and how it affects community corrections. Discuss the community corrections zero tolerance policy. Understand your role as a staff member in a client's right to be free from sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Educate our staff to recognize signs of sexual assault, sexual misconduct, and sexual harassment, and to report to the appropriate personnel. Apply appropriate strategies to intervene when staff suspect prohibited sexual behavior. Understand the correctional culture and how changes in staff attitudes will reduce and prevent prohibited sexual behavior. Have a thorough understanding of providing medical aid to the victim, security procedures, and what to do following an incident. The goals of PREA and the PREA standards are to pre prevent, reduce, eliminate, investigate, provide intervention and treatment, and seek prosecution for violators. How we are at meeting the goal. To meet the goal of PREA, community corrections will institute seven major steps. First, we wanna establish a zero tolerance policy relating to sexual assault, sexual misconduct, and sexual harassment. CDCJ zero tolerance policies as well. We wanna implement an assessment instrument to identify potential sexual aggressors and those who may be sexually vulnerable. Three, we wanna educate and orient our clients on awareness, prevention, and reporting. Four, we want to train staff on awareness, prevention, intervention, and reporting of incidents of sexual misconduct, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. And last, at fifth, institute a confidential telephone reporting system for use by clients and staff to report sexual misconduct, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. DOC clients can call the number listed on your screen, and staff can report at a Prius staff line listed at the number on your screen. Clients can also send a letter to the DOC PREA manager, DCJ director, or contact the local community corrections board. Six, we want to implement crime scene procedures, investigation protocols, ensure medical and mental health treatment is provided to the victims of assault. And lastly, we want to gather PREA statistical information throughout the entire correctional process. Why should we care? Why do this? We establish professional working relationships with our clients. We want clients to feel safe. We also want to reduce the number of sexual incidences that occur in our facilities. And we want to create a safer environment for both staff and clients. All clients should be free from experiencing sexual abuse and sexual harassments in our facilities. Now, how might offenders' sexual assault influence my safety as a staff member? One, it can increase tension in the facilities. Two, it can possibly lead to suicide attempts. And last, it can increase aggression and assault towards community correction employees or clients. You might also ask how might offender sexual assault influence community safety? And we know through research that offenders that commit sex offenses in a prison have a higher arrest rate for violent crimes upon release. We also have known through evidence that some prison sexual assault victims, especially those that do not receive treatment, can become sexual predators upon release to the community. This is a video that we would like to share with you regarding sexual um, assault in prison setting. Please watch and take notes um, so we can review questions after the video. You got all kinds of stuff, people beating up people for commissary, you got people uh, beating up people for their tennis shoes, 
You got people just just sodomizing people, just you know, just going rambunctious. Someone comes in and, and is kind of scared or hesitant and stuff like that, shy, you know, he's gonna get turned out. You know, chances are real high, you know, that you're gonna get turned out. You're gonna get turned out. They rape him, you know, go in there and rape him, you know, and guys sometimes, you know, commit suicide because of that. To all my family that I ever knew, I can't live life being mistreated, lied and stolen from, and most of all being hurt. I most of all mean being behind bars when I say being hurt. We had about a two minute long conversation. And he was crying on the phone. And he said, Mom, I'm emotionally and mentally destroyed. That's the last time I really ever heard his voice. The physical exam in the records did document that. There were tears in the anus at certain times. They usually call it at 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock, given as a diagram of a clock. Even though it was documented, it was just covered over of it as if it never happened. I have found forgiveness for those who have hurt me in my life, which has been a very short one, only 17 years. Well, Rodney, he was a really small stature person. He probably didn't weigh 105 pounds at the most. I'll never forget his face and his eyes. He had the sweetest face and he smiled. I remember he, he smiled a lot. Unfortunately, in the prison, there's a hierarchy or a pecking order. There are those that they call the haves and the have-nots. Rodney would be considered a have-not. I'm very sorry to end my life this way, but if I don't do this, someone will. I'm saying I'd rather die of my own free will than be killed. That's why I must do this. If I remember correctly, this trash can, we have caught it. Right here. It was. Yeah. It might have been right there, but I think it's been moved. It has I think been. it was it's a little right closer there. I mean, we had flames come out of the trash can that got, I would say, at least 10, 15 feet high from different chemicals poured in and it's lighting it. You know, it barely been burnt. It matter of minutes they had it out. But it's the fact of what little things you can do that can still have you put to prison. You know, misdemeanor arson, where did it get us? You know, it was funny the time being, but where did it get him today? I mean, it's just hard to sit here and look at this and you realize this is probably one of the last spots I actually seen him at was in that yard. A kid like that shouldn't have been in prison, but because of the judicial system, we're sending a lot of young, troubled kids to the joint because they don't know what else to do with it. The classification system, if it had been running appropriately, should have kept him out of a cell or out of an environment where a guy was sodomizing him. I think he was desperate and unfortunately in this case there were people in, the, in this department I was in that were less than professional to say the least. The psychologist said he's just another fucking inmate and I, I rebuttaled I said but he's being raped and they're beating him and he said he probably likes it. Frankly, in my own experience, uh, it, it has almost never happened that we came up and verified that the offense did take place, or if the offense, uh, or if there was some sexual activity, there wasn't some consensual agreement involved. Now, I'm not saying that rape doesn't take place in the penitentiary because it does. You know, you can see this pattern in some of the investigations that express this disbelief that a guy who did not want to have anal sex could be the victim of a rape. You know, that somehow, if it happened, it was because the guy wanted it. State grievance, 12 21 95. I have been sexually and physically assaulted several times by several inmates. I'm afraid to go to sleep, to shower, and just about everything else. I'm afraid that when I'm doing these things, I may die in any minute. Please, sir, help me. You were seen by the Unit Classification Committee on December 18, 1995, and your request for protection was denied unanimously. Unless you have new information to support your case for protection, your grievance is denied. 11396. I fear that my life is in danger. I've been threatened, jumped, and nearly stabbed many of times. 
I request to be placed on protective custody. You have been reviewed twice by the Unit Classification Committee. Both times your request for protection was denied. Unless you have information to present, your request is still denied. I called the ward. They asked the warden what was going on. What was he doing about it? And he wasn't doing nothing. He told me, he even told Rodney, learn to grow up. You're just a little boy. Learn to grow up. This happens every day. Learn how to deal with it. It's no big deal. And I've been told that so many times. Even when I would ask him, I said, I'm trying really, really hard to get you some help. Can you hang on? He'd say, I'll, I'll try. I'll try real hard. P.S. I love you all. I wish I could be with you all. Spiritually, I am. Signed, Rodney Hewlin. I love you, Mom and Dad. All right, as part of the Google form, we're gonna also debrief about the video. What were you, your thoughts about the video? And can your reactions to sexual assault have an effect on the offender's safety or other offender's safety? The Prison Rape Elimination Act of 2003 was in response to many allegations of prison rape that was occurring um, in many prisons across the country. Federal laws enacted in September 2003 requires all correctional institutions to assess all incarcerated offenders, whether adult or juvenile, for their propensity to commit sexual violence or their potential to be victimized by sexual violence and investigate and prosecute those crimes. So before we get too far into the PREA standards and what's required in policy, we're going to review definitions. First, when we talk about prison rape, prison rape can be defined as rape as the carnal knowledge, oral sodomy, sexual assault with an object, sexual fondling of a person, forcibly or against that person's will, or not forcibly or against the person's will, where the victim is incapable of giving consent because of his or her youth, temporary or permanent mental or physical incapacity, the carnal knowledge achieved through the exploitation of the, of the fear or threat of physical violence or bodily injury. Now, sexual assault is forced and non-consensual, sexual intrusion, sexual contact, or sexual penetration. Sexual misconduct, on the other hand, is any behavior or act of a sexual nature directed toward anyone by another person. This includes staff or other clients. Sexual, sexual misconduct includes, but is not limited to, acts, threats, requests for sexual acts, attempts to commit acts such as sexual contact or obscenity, behavior of a sexual nature or implication of the same, taking or soliciting photographs, pictures of a person's nude breasts, genitalia, or buttocks, invasion of privacy for sexual gratification, incidences of an inappropriate or intentional touching of the genitalia, anus, groin, breast, inner thigh, or buttocks, or other body parts with the intent to abuse, arouse, or gratify sexual desire includes threats or requests for sex. Now, sexual harassment is defined as non-contact behavior or acts that subjects another person to verbal or written statements or gestures of sexual or romantic nature, creating or encouraging an atmosphere of intimidation, hostility, or offensiveness as perceived by the individual who observes the sexual offensive behavior or act, including but not limited to the following. Any repeated and or unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, obscene or profane language or verbal comments or actions of a derogatory or offensive sexual nature, including demeaning references to gender, inappropriate sexually suggestive or derogatory comments about body or clothing, or obscene language or sexually harassing gestures or written statements of a sexual or romantic nature indecent exposure of any intentional or unwanted displays of anus, genitals, 
breasts or other body parts to sexually harass another person or masturbation in the presence of direct vision of another person. Voyeurism or invasion of privacy for the purf purpose of sexual gratification or intent to abuse or arouse sexual desire taking or soliciting photographs or images of a person's nude breasts, genitalia, buttocks, naked body, or while performing bodily functions, any unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, unequal treatment, or other unwelcome verbal and physical conduct based on sex. Submission to such conduct is made either explicitly or implicitly as a term or condition of an individual's employment or submission to or rejection of such conduct is used as the basis for employment decisions about a person or such conduct has a purpose or effect of substantially and unreasonably interfering with a DOC employee contractor or volunteers work performance or creating an intimate, intimidating, hostile or offensive work or educational environment. Now there's two types of sexual assault, sexual misconduct or sexual harassment. We have client on client, or staff on client. An employee, contract employee, or volunteer of a correctional institution, or an individual who performs work or volunteer functions in a correctional institution, who engages in sexual conduct with a person who is in lawful custody in a correctional institution, commits the offense of sexual conduct in a correctional institution pursuant to CRS 18-7-701. So please keep in mind that sex, staff sexual conduct in community corrections is not only a federal violation of PREA standards, but is also a state statute. And if charged and convicted in the state of Colorado, a possible condition could be the requirement to register as a sex offender and criminally charged. Now, staff sexual misconduct is really easy to define because it's any behavior of a sexual nature, whether verbal, nonverbal, or physical, and is strictly prohibited. When we talk about prohibited sexual behavior, um, the definition is used to describe all prohibited sexual behavior, which includes assault and rape, sexual conduct in a correctional institution, sexual misconduct, and sexual harassment. Keep in mind when we start talking about PREA allegations and reporting that false allegations shall result in disciplinary action and or could result in criminal charges being filed. One of the areas where we have a lot of PREA reports comes from pat down searches. So while conducting searches, we want to make sure staff runs their hand on, along a client's clothed body to de detect any concealed contra contraband. Make sure it's the back of the hand and there's a lot of space between you and the client, that you're not prolonging touching a client's um, body parts, that we're not touching client's genitalia area, um, and the search is looking for um, contraband, and that is the purpose of the pat-down search. The search consists of also outer protective clothing, bags, books, papers, purses, or any other items carried by a client. Pat-down searches of clients will be conducted by employees of the same gender. ATC does not support cross-gender searches, and cross-gender searches will never be allowed. Please call your on-call if a situation comes up where a cross-gender search is necessary. Oftentimes, we'll end up using the wand or other means of searching without having to do a physical pat-down search. Oftentimes, clients will make accusations of sexual harassment related to being pat-down searched. Always be respectful and sensitive while conducting a pat-down search and make sure to always remain professional, including professional language with clients. Do not make inappropriate jokes while doing a pat-down search. And remember, strip searches are never conducted by Advantage Treatment Center staff. Now, next, there's a case study from the California prison. It's an article that was written. It will be attached in the Google form for you to review and answer the questions in the Google form. Please make sure to pull that form to answer the questions. Next, we wanna talk about client orientation and education. During the intake process, 
all clients shall receive an orientation that includes community corrections policy and procedures relating to PREA. This includes sexual assault, sexual misconduct, and sexual harassment. The information is communicated by PowerPoint or communicated in their intake paperwork and can be communicated verbally or in writing or both. Clients also will view the PREA video as part of the intake process. Each facility also completes an initial assessment interview to review a client risk in their history, risk of sexual victimization or sexual aggressive behavior. And this will assist us in housing, work assignments and program assignments. This will be done in order to comply with federal PREA standards to identify known or potential sexual aggressors and victims. And this is trained to case managers or select security staff in a separate training done by your trainer, whoever you're shadowing on site um, or your coach. What might be some behaviors of a sexual aggressor? Extortion, psychological manipulation, intimidation, threats, fighting, gang activity, sexual advances, or befriending a weaker client. Some of the reasons for sexual activity include sexual gratification, power sexual domination, gang related, hatred, racism, expression of sadistic cruel tendencies, homo and homosexual relationships. Sexual aggressors, a way to look at it is aggressor makes an investment in the victim and will at some point want a return on that investment. The investment may have been protection against other clients. The return may be in the form of sex or prostitution. Many times the aggressor does not view himself or herself as a homosexual. The aggressor views these activities as an exercise of power and control. Are aggressors naive enough to think that no one will find out? Yes. Aggressors tend to be arrogant enough to think that they will, won't get away with it. Sexual assault victims, when we talk about them, the definition going forward will be a person who reports having been subjected to sexual assault while incarcerated in a DOC facility, a private prison, community corrections facility, jail, or juvenile facility. Some of the traits of a potential sexual victim are nonviolent, loner, low self-esteem, young elderly, looks good, displays feminism mannerisms, naive, small statured, looks scared, weak, timid, shy, not street smart, transgender, intersex, gay, lesbian, or bisexual, mentally ill, disabled, or a new arrival or history of abuse. Bottom line is prison rape is real. Prison rape is violent. Prison rape is causing real suffering. Prison rape causes health issues and rape in any custodial setting is destructive. Some of the responses that a, a potential a victim will feel after a sexual assault is suicidal feelings and depression, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, fear, anxiety, and hypervigilance, alienation, exacerbation of pre-existing psychiatric disorders, substance abuse, anger, aggression towards other offenders or community corrections employees to escape the situation or as part of their anger, Signs of victimization include onset of fights, visible injuries, confrontations with staff, new onset of makeup, changes in hygiene, suicidal tendencies, theft prone, guilt, frustration, or depression, increase in disciplinary reports, and requests to change accommodations. Both these responses to being victimized or the signs of victimization isn't a predictor that someone is a victim. They're just warning signs to look out for that can change our dialogue with the client. And maybe we need to start asking different questions. So please look out for these, but in no means are they a predictor that someone is a victim. And remember, you cannot judge whether someone has been sexually assaulted by their emotional reaction. 
Not everyone reacts the same way in any given circumstances. And you might not be able to tell someone has been victimized from a sexual assault situation. So don't make preconceived judgments. Make sure to listen, pay attention, and ask good questions. Now, one thing we need to note is that clients and staff are, are um, protected to be free from retaliation. Clients and employees both have the right to be free from retaliation by other clients or staff when reporting an incident involving sexual assault, sexual misconduct, or sexual harassment. If someone feels as if they are being retaliated against or knows of retaliation against a client or staff member is happening, they should report it immediately and are required to report it as a staff member as part of this policy. Violators will be disciplined accordingly. Now, prohibited sexual behavior can be reported in any of the following ways, and this is for clients. They can tell a staff member you trust or they trust or send a letter to the program director. And for confidential reporting, they can call the DOC tip line if they're a DOC client or send a letter to the DOC pre manager, DCJ director, or contact the local community corrections board. Remember, clients always have the right to contact law enforcement or request to speak to medical or mental health staff. Now, the procedures for sexual assault will be part of the Google form, and it will ask you what steps that you take if you are a first responder to it, a sexual assault situation. Please take note of these steps. The first thing we want to do is separate and isolate. This includes both the victim and the perpetrator until further notice by your program director. Immediately notify your supervisor and local law enforcement, not necessarily in that order. Instruct both the victim and the perpetrator not to shower, wash, brush their teeth, use their restroom, change clothing, or anything else that could potentially compromise evidence, such as smoking a cigarette. So our priorities when we're managing a crime scene is personal safety, preserve life, prevent further hostilities, protect the scene, and preserve evidence. We also want to cordon off the crime scene and keep a log of all people entering and their purpose. Staff shall be aware of and prevent common crime scene destruction factors by not stepping through blood, not touching weapons, not moving or touching evidence, and not allowing non-critical response personnel to enter the scene. Dangerous weapons may be picked up only if they present a clear and present danger to the safety and security of the facility, staff, and clients. If possible, staff shall leave weapons in place until law enforcement retrieves them. Some of the common crime scene destruction factors that we have noted are stepping through blood, touching weapons, moving or touching evidence, allowing non-critical response personnel to enter the scene and failing to keep a log. Remember, evidence is used in court to establish the facts of the crime and must be treated with care and respect. Once law enforcement arrives, you're expected and required to let them take over. We are not criminal investigators and we want law enforcement to handle it. Something that we might have to do as part of our job of preserving life and safety is to do threshold questioning. Threshold questioning will be within the first 10 to 15 minutes of this scene. We want to record any spontaneous utterances from the victim or the perpetrator. We want to ask inquisitive inquiring questions such as what happened? Was anyone injured? Who else might be involved? Do you need medical attention, immediate emergency medical attention? Do you need a victim's advocate? Or we might have to ask um, questions like, was there a weapon involved? And is there any witnesses? Please remember to treat the victim with dignity and respect. Now your director will have information on who our victim advocate is and who we work with. Each site has a different local agency that we may use for victim advocacy. The victim advocate can accompany and support the victim through the forensic medical examination process and investigatory interviews and provide emotional support, crisis intervention, information, and referrals. Clients have a right to a victim advocate when requested. Now, another thing that could happen is a need for interpreter services. 
This will happen if a client is hearing impaired, vision impaired, or may not speak enough English for us to be able to communicate efficiently and effectively. In these situations, employees or contract workers may not be able to adequately, adequately translate the services um, and may require services of a qualified language translator for non-English speaking clients. This arrangement comes at no cost to the client, the interpreter information is in the PREA folder located in the ATC toolkit on the Google Drive. Inform the director that you have used this service if you've had to access the interpreter service for any reason and only use it for emergency PREA situations or PREA related translating situations that occur in our facility. The next thing we wanna make sure to do is encourage clients to seek a SANE examination if a sexual assault has occurred. Why should we want, why do we want to use SANE? Well, first they're, profes they're professionally trained to use a victim-centered approach. The people who conduct a SANE exam is a registered nurse who has received advanced forensic education and preparation. A SANE exam is a medical forensic examination and an expert process for collecting evidence to seek prosecution. We wanna to try to make sure that the, the response to the hospital is as timely as possible. The SANE exam nurses will use specialized equipment to assist in documenting injury and collecting evidence. And they, they make available expert in court for, for expert court testimony and improves the potential for a positive prosecution. So if we hear of some, uh, something that might fall under these PREA definitions, what do we do? We want to report it. So when you gain knowledge that a crime may have been committed, you should follow policy by documenting and reporting it immediately to a supervisor, and then the supervisor will make the appropriate notifications and follow up. Now the staff reporting procedures is very similar to what a client's is, um, but we also wanna make sure to follow the process when staff hears of a PREA related potential incident that has occurred. And we always wanna make sure to document, document, document. So staff who receive any information, regardless of its source, it could be third party, it could be in writing, non-written, it could be um, verbal, it could be from a friend or a family member of a client, and it can stay anonymous. These, this is information concerning the sexual assault, sexual misconduct, or sexual harassment. And if you have a reason to suspect it, or you observe an incident, you need to immediately report the incident. The supervisor will notify the facility director and contact law enforcement. And we might ask you to complete a detailed incident report, or the supervisor will complete the incident report. Staff shall accept reports made verbally in writing anonymously and from third parties, and shall promptly document any verbal reports. Staff are required to report immediately any knowledge or suspicion of information regarding an incident of sexual abuse or sexual harassment that occurred in a facility, whether or not it's part of the agency. Retaliation against residents also need to be reported. Um, and any staff neglect or violation of responsibilities that could have contributed to an incident or retaliation also needs to be reported. Our staff confidential options for reporting include an 800 number for the DOC clients for the DOC tip line, the Prius staff line at 719-226-4621, or we can also send the letter to the DOC PREA manager, DCJ director of the or the Community Corrections Board. And of course, you always can talk to your director, your immediate supervisor, or me, the PREA coordinator. One of the things that's part of the PREA standards and our ATC policy is all cases involving sexual assault will be referred to law enforcement for presentation of appropriate cases to the district attorney for prosecution. We are required to seek prosecution in any criminal case involving sexual assault or sexual harassment. Your director will and the PREA coordinator will decide based on criteria and definition, which incidences will go criminal and which one falls under administrative. It also is important for us to note the rules around deliberate indifference. 
staff can be held personally liable for neglecting job duties that result in an incident. Staff can also be sued as an employee of a community corrections facility and also as an individual for deliberate indifference. If you're found guilty or willful and wanton misconduct or conduct outside the course and scope of employment, an employee could also lose assets, including personal party, as part of a lawsuit. Mandatory reporting for those who fall under mandatory, mandatory reporting rules, medical and mental health practitioners are required to report sexual abuse and to um, inform clients of the practitioner's duty to report and the limitation of confidentiality at the initial initiation of services, preferably during intake. The facility must report all allegations of sexual abuse and harassment, including third party and anonymous reports to the facility um, director um, and the, our facility investigators. Now, one of the things that cause a PREA incident for us to start an investigation is communication and ways for you to avoid being part of a PREA allegation or an alleged PREA allegation is to communicate effectively. First, you wanna treat clients with respect while maintaining positive professional attitudes and relationships. Treat all clients equally. This will help you become a target of showing preferential or harsh treatment to certain individuals. Be a role model and an available resource to our clients. Use professional language when speaking to clients at all times. This will help keep you safe from any boundary issues or offensive or inappropriate conversations. Use professional nonverbals, such as body language, posture, facial expressions, etc. Listen, pay attention, and encourage good behavior and progress. Never accept gifts from or give gifts to clients. Maintain professional relationships always, regardless of location. Never fraternize or associate with clients outside of work. Always follow policy and procedures, regardless of how clients may try to persuade you. Don't talk about personal matters at work. Offenders may overhear and may attempt to use what they have heard against you and treat everyone equally, regardless of how sorry you feel for them or how they may try to persuade you to bend the rules. Basically, set boundaries and stick by them. Now, there's specific things we need to know about transgender and intersex clients. The definition of transgender is a term describing persons whose gender identity and or expression do not conform to the gender rules assigned to them at birth. The definition of an intersex client would be a condition usually present at birth that involves reproductive, genetic, or sexual anatomy that does not seem to fit the typical definitions of female or male. LBGTI communication is largely important. And remember, there is a zero tolerance policy for discrimination and mistreatment of clients and staff on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Ensure that all staff and residents are treated with fairness, dignity, and respect. Staff and volunteers should use language and terminology that does not perpetuate, perpetuate LGBTI stereotypes and helps clients stay on a path of success. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex residents pose unique challenges and report higher rates of sexual victimization compared to other clients. All staff should be able to identify, communicate with, and manage interactions with LGBTI residents to enhance facility safety and promote success. When it comes to housing placement, trans transgender and intersex residents may have special housing needs where facility capacity can accommodate them. Housing may be determined using the following criteria. Serious consideration, seriously consider the client's own idea and concerns regarding housing placement. Review the facility capacity and accommodations with consideration of safety and security concerns. Work with the client to make the most appropriate placement to enhance their safety and security. Some of the examples that you might use when trying to compromise between a client's consideration and facility safety is using single occupancy rooms, using private or staff bathrooms, having separate showering schedules from the other clients or placing beds closest to the security office. 
Individuals address the safety and privacy needs of LGBTI residents in toileting, showering, and sleeping. Ensure residents pat and strip searches are conducted professionally in accordance with policy. And remember, ATC staff will never conduct a cross-gender pat-down search or a strip search. Searches will be conducted with professionalism while being respectful and the least intrusive manner possible to safety and security concerns being paramount. Searches will be consistent and thorough in all circumstances. Staff will not search or phys physically examine a transgender or intersex client for the sole purpose of determining their genital status. If the client's genital status is unknown, it may be determined during conversations with the client or by reviewing medical records. Some common male and female client differences include males often will trade or do things to get sex. Males may often keep emotions bottled up and they may often look to allies for protection. On the other hand, females often use sex as a way to get things in return, often display more emotion and often look to allies for connection. A little bit about female client dynamics that might be a little different than our male population. Women who are victimized of abuse tend to continue on as victims of abuse. Men, on the other hand, tend to react to their own history of victimization by becoming abusers themselves. One of the things that females do that are very specific um, and different from the male population is they may create a family unit. Incarcerated women are known for often forming families and creating gender roles specific to that family. They may also develop gay for the stay relationships as part of this. Last, we wanna end with talking about correctional culture and culture in general. How many times have you heard someone talk about prison sex? And how about on TV shows, commercials, radio programs, casual jokes? How many of you have told these jokes? Does prison sex bring a picture to mind? Is it gender specific? Is it funny? Is it acceptable? Do you associate prison rape with a powerful, large bean looking offender covered with tattoos? The media plays a large role in this as TV cops usually threaten suspects with how big and tough their celly will be. The standard joke dealing with bending over is told in many forms. There are computer websites dedicated to inappropriate jokes. Something for us to be aware of is the culture and how we perpetuate that culture and be aware of the correctional culture around us and how we're um, modeling these things to our clients. Let's talk a little bit about prevalence. Statistics have revealed some some drastic numbers in the last couple of years. The last report from the National from the Bureau of Justice Statistics on their survey of sexual victimization was in 2011 and 2015. The first thing that we note is that correctional administrators reported 24,661 allegations of sexual victimization in 2015, which nearly triples the number recorded in 2011. In 2015, an estimated 1,473 allegations were substantiated, up 63% from the 902 substantiated in 2011. And 58% of substantiated incidences of sexual victimization in 2015 were per perpetrated by inmates, while 42% were perpetuate per perpetrated by staff members. Consider this. Sexual assault is probably higher than the previous slides reports. It's important to note that for many female offenders, the sexual abuse occurred before the age of 18. Some people may ask at the end of this presentation, what does prison rape have to do with community corrections? And just consider that these, these traits, characteristics, warning signs, behaviors, um, culture and conduct um, have to do with our clients because they are our clients. A lot of our clients have previous prison stays, they came from prison, and some of our clients may be potential sexual aggressors, and some of our clients may be potential sexual victims. And that's why this training is so important. If you have any questions, please review the PREA standards um, or the PREA policy in the Google Drive. 
And you can also ask me the PREA coordinator, Christy Garcia. Thank you for attending this video. Please make sure to fill out your Google form to receive training credit. Have a nice day.